Hi, I'm Mark, and uh, today we're going to try and replicate what's happening in the ocean into the home aquarium. And this is all about how, hopefully a tutorial on how to set up a local marine tank. Because we're going to take a slice of the ocean, we're going to put a box around it, and we're going to put it in your home. Now, one of the main things we need to look after all the time is the quality of the water. It does, we don't have to worry about the animals too much at the moment, but we need to make sure that our water quality is clear. And to do that, we run through uh, what they call a nitrifying process in an aquarium, and it's where the fish do their poos and wheeze, and all the bacteria that live in the tank, and the little bits and pieces that uh, creatures that live in there as well, and they're going to convert all those waste of ammonia um, into uh, good stuff, which is not going to harm the animals, and will actually be taken up by some of the animals, the filter feeders, and the plants. What we need to do to replicate this is we need to, when we set a tank up, we need to look at the animals we're going to keep in the tank and they're compatible with each other. We're going to have to look at the types of rock we're using. The main type of rock is the coral rock that comes from the uh, tropical reefs because there's a lot more surface area in that, very porous rocks, and the surface area in there is going to allow a lot more bacteria. Now what happens is the bacteria, they'll eat the poos and weeds that the fish are doing, which is ammonia, they turn that into what they call nitrites. Another bacteria comes along, eats that, turns it into nitrates, and then that is taken up and is not as toxic to all the animals and the fish in the fish tank. Now, now we'll talk about um, the substrate that we're going to put in the tank. Now, substrate in a local marine tank is very important to give a lot of what they call the cleanup crew. And these are the animals that live in the tank that will take care of a lot of the waste that's been put out by the fish. And we're talking the, the likes of worms, annelids, um, polychaetes. Um, down here we've got a sea cucumber. And what these guys do is they travel through the sand. And you can see this is the front part of them here. And he's actually like the giant worms that were on June. He's filtering the sand and it goes in one end and out the other. And as he's doing that, he's cleaning all the diatoms and, and all the little bits and pieces. You can see all the muck that's sitting on top of the sand here. And he's filtering that through a system and taking it back out again. And um, they all live in the substrate. Also, too, in the sand, in the top 12 mil of the sand, is where all, uh, a lot of the bacteria live, too. And when we get into the deep sand bed, so you've either got to have a very shallow sand bed of around about 12 mil, or a sand bed that's about 100 mil, uh, or four inches. And what happens with the deep sand bed as there's worms and stuff that live in there, but we have a lot going on down deep, which is what they call anaerobic bacteria, and that helps to take a lot of the nitrates out of your tank as well. So um, we need it to keep the animals living happily, but we also need it to help with that water quality again. If I can keep the water clean enough, then the fish are just gonna be as happy as Larry. One of the things with the local marines, we don't want our animals going over 22 degrees centigrade in temperature in the tank because a lot of our water here does not go over that and the animals start to break out with fungal diseases, white spots and right. stuff like that because they're not used to it. Um, and to achieve that we use a chiller. And uh, a chiller is very important. Now, a lot of people think they can go down to a rock pool and pick out the animals out of the rock pool because some of those animals can take very high temperatures. But always remember that that rock pool is getting flushed with fresh water twice a day and it's only hot during the daytime, it's not hot over night time. So if you want to sustain life on a, on a permanent basis, you have to provide a stable environment. And we're talking stable water quality, which means that there's no muck and, and toxins in the water, and we're looking at stable temperature as well. Our little coloured friend over here on the purple sponge is what they call a clown nudibranch. And the nudibranch means naked gill. And if you have a look at the rear end of him, which is on the right-hand side, that's that little purple tuft there, that's a gill and that's how he breathes. And the front end here, the little two little purple spines on him, that's his um, uh, feelers or antennae. And um, on the front is the mouth part. When you're taking these out of the wild, you always got to remember, you've got to be able to supply the food for them. And some of these nudibranch only eat a certain type of sponge or hydrozoan or bryzoan. So you need to be able to supply the food all the time, otherwise the animal is just going to end up dying on you. It's one of the things when you're picking up um, animals out of rock pools. Um, it's, it's, it's better to go and do the research first and find out what the animal requires to live rather than just pick it up, take it home and then find out you can't get back to the beach for three or four weeks and your animals died on you. One of the things to be very aware of all the time is are fish compatible with each other in a tank? Because in the ocean, basically it runs down to with fish, if it'll fit in my mouth, I'm going to eat it. And what we need to do here is be committed. Now, this is a seahorse tank, 
and that's why in here we have seahorses, we have pipefish, all members of the same family. We have some sponges, we have the nudibranch, we have some pleurobranchs as well, and chitons and invertebrates. So nothing in here is in a really aggressive fish that will attack the seahorses and eat them. Um, and so, whereas in the other tank, we'll show you later on, over there we have all what we call the bad boys tank, where it's a dog eat dog or fish eat fish world. And it's a faster current. A lot faster current, a lot more movement in that tank. This has a good current in it, which has been achieved by the power head up here. But we're getting a flow that runs through the tank and it circulates back and we take the water back out of the tank uh, through the overflow pipe here and then it comes down into the sump down the bottom. At this one at the moment we're running 6,000 litres per hour through the sump. In here we're trying to circulate the contents of the tank around about hopefully about up to 10 times uh, the volume of the tank going through the sump per hour and which allows our skimmer, which is another vital piece of equipment, to take all the proteins and all the bits and pieces. And also too, your flow is producing oxygen into the water. Air stones don't actually put oxygen in the water. What they do is they cause a flow at the surface of the water up here. And this is where the gas exchange takes place. And as the water turns over, all the nitrogen and all the bad gases, carbon dioxide, are getting pushed out of the water and at the same time it's being replaced with oxygen molecules which are running through the water in the tank. Um, when you set up a tank with the seahorses you want a tank that doesn't have a, a huge current in it because they're, they're not a strong swimmer but um, you can actually have quite a bit of current there because it's quite amazing how much uh, current they can stand and they will hang on to um, uh, at the, in the run of the tide, they'll hang onto substrate and, and weed and stuff on the bottom to anchor themselves. They don't look like a fish, but they actually are a fish. They have the fin on the back, and they've got little fins on the side of their heads that they used to steer themselves and propel themselves through the water. But these guys have settled down to tank life very quickly, and they'll, they're out all the time. And they've actually become uh, happy to have humans around because they know that the humans are supplying the food to them. Uh, this tank here is a 800 litre tank and it's got a 150 litre sump underneath it so the whole system here is 950 litres. This one actually runs at around about 16 degrees. I find the 16 degree temperature is probably where the animals function the best. You can lower it right down to 8, even 6 degrees, but your animals will all slow down, won't feed as well, whereas this way here, they're at their optimum level of operation. Animals need to have a certain set of lighting, so they operate what they call the phototrophic period, and so what they do is they need to sleep, and they need to um, uh, work and, and operate during the daytime. So we need to keep a standard set of lighting, and I usually run around about 10 to 12 hours a day to sort of approximate what the average might be out there. A lot of people are using the new LEDs, which is what this one here is, and that brings out your colour. You can see the shimmer it gives in the water. Metal halides are another type of lighting you can use on the fish tank, but metal halides produce a lot of heat, and all we're looking for is the light factor. We're not looking for heat, because we're trying to keep the tank as, as cool as possible. And so what we'll do is we can run to the metal halides, or what they call nowadays is T5HO, which is a little tiny fluorescent tubes, and um, they're actually more efficient than the old style big fat fluorescent tubes because they give a lot better wavelength of light and a lot more penetration in the tank. Um, if you're wanting to grow the weeds, like this bit of sea rumu that's laying in here at the moment, that needs to have the blue wavelength of light and a, basically a bright daylight look to it to allow that plant to photosynthesize. Whereas the red plants, which are down the other end of the tank, they don't need as much lighting because they are um, from used to being in deeper water and so they don't need to photosynthesize. We've showed you now what a low flow, single community type of fish, they're all compatible in this tank. Um, they're a good way to start, really beautiful, really interesting for the kids because of the way that they breed and if you're lucky that they're happy in the tank, they will breed for you. Uh, we'll now step on I suppose and we'll go and do the bad boys and show you what a different type of tank looks like and uh, maybe a uh, uh, more and easier to tank to look after than what the seahorse tank is.